what, an, what an honor it is to be here with, at, at Carnegie Mellon, to be here with the support of the National Science Foundation, especially to be here with, with uh, uh, this group of panelists. So we're not replacing people or docs. We're extending our capabilities. They were really rough on these robots. We put together these beautiful arms, and they will just pull them apart. This thing about robot missions is that you don't have to bring anything back and that's expected with humans. When NASA got a hold of that, they said, you can't do that, we're in charge of not doing that. Um. I want to allow the, our, our distinguished panelists to, to introduce themselves and each to just, just tell me very briefly you know, um, your affiliation and, and more, more relevantly, um, what aspect of robotics you, you work on. And uh, Robin, let me start with you. I'm Robin Murphy. I'm the Raytheon Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M. And I do rescue robots, not only the research, but I've been in 11 disasters, not of my own making, from the World Trade Center through most recently the Cologne, Germany building collapse. Great. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit out of order. I want to introduce uh, Red. You want to talk a little bit? I'm Red Whitaker. Uh, I specialize in robots beyond the built environment. These are machines that develop, secure, feed this world, and explore worlds beyond. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Javier Movellan. I lead the Machine Perception Laboratory at the University of California, San Diego, where we put together some machine perception technologies that you may actually be using in your cameras now when they recognize your smiles and take pictures of your smiles. Um, I have a very um, peculiar scientific career. I started uh, studying uh, human infants and how they learn. Then I came to Carnegie Mellon University where I was learning, or I studied how machines learn, and I started machine learning. And, and then later on, I kind of felt that it was really important in order to understand human intelligence to understand how to put together sensors and actuators to produce intelligent behavior. And so I moved more toward robotics. Um, and I've been studying or working with robots that have to interact with people, particularly with children um, in daily life conditions. Uh, my name's Rodney Brooks. I've been a professor at MIT for far too long, where I've worked on uh, everything from nanobots to planetary explorers to humanoid robots. Uh, back in 1990, two of my students and I started a company now called iRobot Corporation. We've um, built and delivered five million home cleaning robots, the Roombas, and thousands of robots for uh, the U.S. and other militaries for uh, improvised explosive device remediation in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. The last year and a half, I've been uh, full-time off at a new company called Heartland Robotics, where we're trying to reinvent uh, uh, industrial robots and uh, bring uh, lots of manufacturing back to the heartland of America. Um, I mean, you, you can hear just from, just from these four very brief descriptions, uh, there's a pretty wide range of what a of what a robot is and what robotics means here, uh, and it's clearly not, you know, you know, in any way restricted sort of the, the popular definition of you know, kind of a humanoid machine that does you know things you know things in the you know the way that a, a person would do the job. Um, anybody here want to take a crack at actually defining what a robot is? And Rodney, you were talking about this earlier. Well, the way I the way I define it, first of all, you know, you can't always you know, when you see a robot, you don't always know when you're seeing one, um, unlike some other things. Uh, a robot, uh, to me, is something that senses the world, uh, does some sort of computation, and decides to take an action outside of its physical extremity. That action might be moving around, or it might be grabbing something and moving it. And I say outside its extremity, because I don't like to let uh, dishwashers be robots. <laughs> I'm a, a little more liberal about that, uh, uh, that uh, one early experience was creating the robots in operation that cleaned up the Three Mile Island accident. And if all were known, uh, those were remote controlled. And uh, uh, 
one of the discounts and insults is that they weren't ro real robots. Uh, the, uh, uh, those machines that are our tour guides to the Titanic or our eyes on Mars uh, don't do a lot of thinking, and they're still good enough in my book. Any other uh, takers on this? Perhaps I, I would add to, uh, to the definition the idea that these systems have to operate uh, situated in space and time, that the real-time constraints are critical and you can't just ignore them. And moreover, the, also that the statistics of the world in which uh, these systems operate are also critical to understand the intelligence of these things. It's not just intelligence in general, but it's intelligence as situated in a particular world. And I'm thinking back to, to both your comments, that sometimes the intelligence is shared. Where's the robot? Is, is, you know, is the robot just the physical entity in Three Mile Island or in a disaster site or, or on the moon, uh, Mars, or is it here with us? It's becoming more and more a shared cognition system. Yeah, I, I, think, I think these definitions will start to become a lot more concrete when we talk about the, the, the real projects that people are working on. And we have some projects here that are they're very much, I would say, you know, kind, kind of ripped from the, from the headlines experiences. Uh, I mean, Robin, you were talking about, about rescue robots um, obviously, the, I mean, the, probably the, the most most recent, you know, heartbreaking place where rescue robots might have been useful would be in Haiti. But it, you actually were not involved with that. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and, and why not? Well, there's there's lots of reasons why you wouldn't have uh, uh, something where you've got over two hundred thousand people killed with extreme logistical nightmare of a condition. Uh, robots, there's not enough to make much of a difference. Bringing a group of scientists along to, to try them out just isn't the right place and time for that, particularly for some of the, uh, when you have all the bureaucratic hassles of just trying to get the airport open and to coordinate with the UN and the United States. But one of the things that we see with the technologies is people think of, well, you know, what would you use ground robots for? Well, if you've got some structural collapses, multi-story collapse, like the hotels, that's a big one. When you're doing earthquakes and hurricanes, we have lots of residential. Nothing beats a dock, you know, because they're pretty shallow. You don't need to go beyond what the conventional technology can. As, as so, so, so where have you had success with rescue robots? We've, had, we've never pulled out anybody who's alive with a rescue robot. We've gone places that the rescuers couldn't go that was too unsafe and they were very worried about and felt that they would have had to go or would have had to take days to shore up to make safe to go in. And we've certainly helped them in, in other ways uh, and confirmed things that way. But think about uh, one thing that was one set of robots that were, were used. If you consider Global Hawk, we were sent out to go and start immediately providing a different type of uh, surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, Evergreen sent out a Skylark to do some low, uh, under 300 feet uh, reviews of the area, things that's hard to see if you think about a very tree area. So aerial vehicles have a lot of use. And then in disasters, you've also, in, in things, Haiti, it's an island, a port, a lot of water. You forget about the bridges and the sea walls. And so you need marine vehicles to help check those things out to keep both for uh, logistics, for transportation, and for recovery, get things back up and going. So, the, so these are all the sort of the directions of what you see as sort of the next. These are next steps for for, for rescue robotics. Yep. The, uh, actually, I, I want to jump from the, the the local to the global. Uh, I mean, another thing that's 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 happening right now. Uh, the Obama administration is is reviewing the the future course of NASA, and the the rumor for the moment, not not officially confirmed, but but what I have on reasonably good authority is that. Um, that NASA is going to about to go through a fairly wrenching uh, change of direction. That that, uh, that some of the core pieces of the the current manned space program are going to be canceled. Uh, the, 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 these these giant rockets, the Ares one and Ares five, that were supposed to be taking humans back to the moon, um, are going to be canceled. Um, and yet, when I mentioned this to uh, to Red, he did not seem at all depressed. I'd like to uh, I'd like to <laughs> find out a little bit about that. My said uh, <laughs> cancellation of. Uh, major launch vehicle developments is very good news for robotics. <laughs> that uh, the robot missions don't require those immense launch payloads. Uh, 
you don't have to uh, uh, keep humans warm, uh, keep them fed and watered and keep them breathing. And of course, the greatest thing about robot missions is that you don't have to bring anything back. And that's expected with humans. Uh, <laughs> the large, uh, uh, this, this is a, a huge opportunity for uh, both non-governmental pursuits of space uh, and to the extent that missions are federal for those to be robot precursors and our eyes and ears to the planets. So would it be fair, it sounds like you're saying that this is not just good for robotics, but this is actually good for people who love exploration. It was a time when that would require federal enterprise, the only way. The space race, the Cold War, the uh, huge missions, a uh, billion dollars a pop. And I don't want to represent that it can be done in a garage, but in these times, uh, it is possible. Uh, it, it, there are very great ways to make parts, uh, uh, hardened computing, uh, the software that's required, the uh, spacecraft, the robots, the communications, uh, the uh, tremendous visualizations of space. and. Uh, Robots uh, are the, the great access of our time. It's actually one of the revolutions. When I was coming up, uh, space exploration did mean humans. And of course, none of the explorers now are humans. And there would be no humans, human missions on the books. And uh, whatever those human futures will be, uh, will be preceded, supported, and accompanied by the great robots of the future. In fact, we have uh, not one but two panelists on stage here who have uh, who've exerted some significant effort figuring out how to how to get a robot to the moon. Um, you, want, you want to talk a little bit about that, and, actually, and, and Rodney as well. Well, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, there's no great mystery in getting to the moon, uh, uh, there is a launch and the uh, escape from uh, the Earth gravity well. And once committed to the moon, there are just two choices. You either crash or land. Now, uh, the low gravity of the moon is very much in the favor of controlled landing and uh, has the tremendous advantages of the technology of our time that just wasn't around 40 years ago. And uh, the other is that uh, the physics that govern are so ideal in the vacuum of free space relative to, say, uh, robot racing in the desert where there's the interaction with terrain and the pounding of dynamics, and so many things that are uh, unanticipated. Well, I think there's a, you know, an important point here, which is that what you're working on is not a government-funded program. This is, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's a, not a giant NASA-style mission. Uh, but you're actually working on something connected to the Google X Prize. The uh, uh, so uh, Google uh, is offering uh, twenty million for the first robot that sends television from the moon. And uh, I intend to win that. <laughs> uh, that uh, uh, there are bonuses for operating after hibernating a night, and bonuses for uh, the robot traveling a certain distance, and bonuses for uh, navigating to a place where uh, humans have sent things before. And in the world of robotics, that is more deliberative than robotic wandering. And uh, that, uh, uh, yes, uh, non-federal, but uh, that's how all of the great technological incentives work. So for example, when Lindbergh went to Paris for his 25,000, uh, it wasn't federal. And, uh, 
that if there is a grand challenge for uh, a technological achievement that uh, explicitly precludes uh, government money. And yet the Lindbergh flight effectively transformed the face of, of aviation. Trans all, all the great prizes completely transformed belief, um, catapult an industry, uh, drive a technology, and um, are rather fun. <laughs> I know, Rodney, you've also thought about this, this problem of, of how, to, how to get the moon basically on, on your own. Yeah, in fact, we um, explicitly failed at it quite a while ago, but implicitly succeeded in another way. Uh, back in 1990, when we started uh, what's now called iRobot Corporation, our original business plan was to send robots to the moon and Mars. And to show you how unrealistic this business plan was, it was to, the way we were going to get money, one of the ways we were going to get money was that scientists using their NSF grants would pay to, for payloads to go there. We also had a, an advertising model, a TV model. We had all sorts of things. We, uh, we'd started a little project out at JPL, which became the Rocker, Rocky Robots. That didn't work, so then we, then we went and we looked for private launches. We eventually got the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization to agree to it. We did a test launch out at Edwards Air Force Base, deployment of the rover um, in Earth gravity. Uh, when NASA got a hold of that, they said, you can't do that. We're in charge of not doing that. Um, <laughs> and they, Dan Golden said, oh, there's this little project out at JPL, the Rocky uh, rovers, um, and we've got this one, Rocky 6, we're up to now. Uh, we've got this lander coming up to, to Mars. We're going to add $25 million and put a rover along with it. And so uh, that's where Sojourner came from and landed on July 4th, 1997. Right, and I, I think I mean you know, to those of us who who really you know, who, who followed space exploration closely, uh, that 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 Sojourner landing was I mean that was really a, a milestone in space exploration. I think I think that was the moment when every you know the, the conventional wisdom had always been you need to send people out up in space to get the public excited, and that was a moment when you know a public that had been that had grown completely jaded and, and, and you know, bored and, and probably cynical about space shuttle flights was electrified by a small robot rolling around on Mars. I think mean, it, it really proved that, that the, the conventional thinking, of not just of how exploration was done, but how public excitement is built, that there was some, there was some significant gap there. Uh, now, I'm interested. So you, you were thinking about going to the moon and Mars, um, and you, you shifted your thinking to, to really a, 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 you know, a, a domestic application, to a, you know, to a, a much more ubiquitous... We had 13 other failed business models. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we can save some of that for the Q and A session, um, but but, uh, so, but, uh, but maybe we can talk a little bit about you know the, the sort of like the shift in thinking that, that or the, the shift in economic thinking perhaps that uh, that led you to to iRobot to you know, something is it's you know a very very different face of robotics. Well, I think the key thing that we did there was to get beyond uh, thinking the way we think as academics, and those of us as academics here will. will, will spend a lot of money on a prototype and test it. Uh, but when we went to saying we're going to sell something to consumers, we had to bring the price way, way down. Uh, we had to make it reliable enough that it would do something useful for a consumer. And we had to think about not building one of them with a team of graduate students to deploy it and look after it, but build hundreds of thousands of them straight off and have them just work when ordinary people were going to use them. And that gets back to users and, and, and you, you know, people interacting with robots uh, you know, you can have all these, you can think about how people should do it, but when you actually give them to uh, consumers in the home or to 19-year-old soldiers in Iraq, they don't use them like you think they ought to. They use them like they want to. And that's a very different way of thinking and preparing for that. Uh, really, really, we had to change uh, how we thought about robots because you, you lose control. It's the robot and the person and their interaction that's important. Well, actually, yeah, and robot-human interaction. Obviously, that, that's that's a that's a big theme. That's it's sort of a, a big area of, of development right now. Um, you know, I think in the, in the past there's often been you know, so, something of a disconnect. Uh, you know, think about the technology as an isolated problem. Think about the you know the, the you know the interaction with humans as a different problem. But um, Javier, you don't really have that luxury because you're you're dealing with 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 robots in, in education where you have the most probably the most critical audience of all, which is small children who are not going to humor you at all. That's right. Uh, so I started working with uh, robots and putting them with uh, toddlers together um, 
you know, in a coincidental manner. I, I, I had this project with Sony, and I know Manuela also had a similar project, and I was really fascinated by the, the problem that Sony uh, brought to me, which is we have these robots, we put a lot of engineering, it was a beautifully designed robot, uh, but we sell them, and we sell them quite well, uh, but we know that after 10 hours of playing with these robots, people put them back in the box, and that's it. And we, that doesn't happen with dogs and pets. People keep <laughs> playing with them. What, what, what's going on? And uh, I, I felt really fascinated by this problem in that here you have to design these robots that so you can have a particular task other than not to be put in that box, right? And uh, it, it really required a different way of thinking, and I loved it. Uh, and I felt, well, one way that uh, perhaps we can address this problem is by uh, having some of the toughest critics on Earth, uh, which is uh, infants. And uh, uh, we chose infants also because they don't speak, yet they're capable of, of developing um, uh, very deep uh, social interaction with other people. And so we saw there is lots of things to learn about the way infants interact with, with adults and also about the type of interaction that we may observe with our robots. And boy, was it a fast way of learning. I mean, uh, first thing is we realized that the robots that have been designed by engineers beautifully did not work at all in these environments. Um, they were beautiful, but after two or three minutes of interaction with the babies, the babies got uh, uh, pretty much uh, bored with them. But most importantly, when we started designing our robots, uh, well, we noticed we'll put a lot of time on putting everything that we had, our smile detection, our best servos, and so on. And they will bring it there. And the children, well, the first time, um, they were very interested in the robot. When we turned it on, they started running around in panic. They were just scared to death. <laughs> and so we were so uh, feeling so sad. Actually, my son uh, was one of the kids in this. Uh, and at night, I could hear him saying, Robot scary, robot scary. So what was the mistake that you made? What was the lesson learned there? Well, you know, it's very hard to tell. The one thing I can tell you is that we went from those robots that scared the children to death to, by the end of the project, mothers telling us, uh, well, Javier, I'm a little bit scared that my child is constantly talking about your robot and a robot here, robot there, and interacting all the time with the robot. Maybe we should have them interact less with him. So, so I was, in a way, I was really happy that we had progressed so much. And critical to that was the fact that we were always going to the field. And let me tell you one thing that we learned. We were trying to design robots that interact with children and that hopefully also would teach children things. The kind of the reality of it was that the first thing we had to do was survive these children. We couldn't teach these children if we didn't survive them. And so, you know, they were really rough on these robots. We put together these beautiful arms, and they would just pull them apart. Um, and so one of the things we noticed is, well, how do they survive each other? Uh, because, you know, they actually get, uh, children get abused. Well, they were abusing the robot, but they also get abused by each other. What do they do? Well, if, if a child bites another child, they cry. Aha. We say it's critical to put some form of emotional mechanism into these robots so that they can actually survive in this environment. So that was the key, for example. So, I mean, the, the, the obvious question with all this is, is why, do you, why do you need a robot in the first place? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, think that's, I think that's the question you know, that, that sort of everybody here is, is out to answer. I mean, robots obviously can, you know, these are things that have, you know, that have patients that have physical capabilities, they can do things that humans can't do. Why do you need right, robot so education? I think there are, well, first of all, there are, there are two answers to this. There is a scientific answer, which is robots are the best way we know to learn about how humans are put together. They really are a reality check on theories, psychological theories, uh, control theories, and artificial intelligence, and so on. Um, but in addition, I, I think as we develop robots that can actually interact with humans and survive in these less controlled environments than the industrial environments, uh, 
we will find them to be an indispensable tool. I can tell you that by, in this field studies, we've noticed that, that these teachers really could, help, could use some help. That in many cases, you know, even with the very good child to teacher ratios that we had in California, I think that's changing now, uh, still there were children that at some point they were by themselves. And uh, most importantly, when we brought these robots there and we got them to work, the children fell in love with them. And, and you know, they were having a blast with them. And so, you know, we were basically improving the quality of the life of these children. Later, we saw that, in fact, we could enhance, for example, their vocabulary skill that they could actually, these robots could actually teach. And you can actually document that these children are learning uh, uh, under the tutelage of the robots. Exactly. At this point, you know, it takes a lot of time to actually get a study where you can actually document that. That's what we did at the end of the project. So our goal now is to really scale this up so that we can learn from the numbers. We work with a single robot. What we want to do is scale this up to 1,000 robots that will be constantly sending us information about what it takes for children to learn, what you know, kind of things the children are learning, what kind of things children are not learning, the effects of different environments, and so on. It's going to be really a microscope of human behavior, or a telescope. So, so, again, so continuing this theme of, like, of beyond human capabilities, what can robots do in search and rescue that a, that a human being or that a, that a dog can't do? Where, where, where do you see this going? Well, I think that's the wrong question. I mean, what you just did was the substitution that, oh, well, we have people, robots replace people. No, we don't need to replace humans and dogs. We need to extend their capabilities. So you start looking at the robots that are useful the trick is to make them, if they're ground robots, to go small, to go deeper into the rubble, more than the 20 feet that the existing technology camera on a stick can go. So that's what you want to do, is to extend people's uh, views within 40 to 100 feet into the depths of the rubble, where you have the possibility of entombed or trapped survivors. Right now, most of the people who will survive beyond a hospital stay, if they're, they're, they're trapped more than five days, uh, are going to be surface victims, people who were not heavily crushed. But people further in typically don't get rescued in time. And this is where technology can help. We can't be hummingbirds. That's just something we're not. So having small helicopters that evaluate structures, give them on-demand overviews of, oh, look, there's people over there. Oh, there's flash flooding. Oh, there's this land use that we couldn't see. Uh, they can fly, the aerial vehicles can fly under the canopies that some of the over the higher flights can't do. And the same thing with looking underwater. I mean, we're not dolphins either. So we're not replacing people or dogs. We're extending our capabilities. And that's the good thing. What about, uh, Randy, I mean, you're, you've been looking at, uh, at robots that have, you know, I would say, you know, industrial, agricultural, you know, that have, have very, very strong commercial aspects. Again, I think, you know, one of the common you know, fears and I would say misconceptions of robots is, is again, that, that you know, if you make a robot that does manual labor, it's going to replace a person that does manual labor. Uh, but what do, you, what, what do you see as the role for, for robots? I mean, where, where, where is this going? Well, uh, in the realm of the uh, world and beyond, these are uh, no-brainer uh, issues. Uh, they start at the first level with the uh, motivations of hazard and whether you're sending something into uh, nuke or very deep sea immersion for uh, science and observation. So then dangerous locations where humans can't dangerous, go. Dangerous um, heat, chemical, vacuum, radiation, obvious. And then the uh, next step up is uh, uh, the uh, motivation of uh, uh, persistence and productivity, the idea of uh, going 24-7 versus uh, a single shift, uh, or uh, for the precision that is possible uh, uh, by guided machine that is unachievable in the long run by uh, Human guidance. That's particularly relevant. So, an assembly now. line or farming oh. or where, where? Well, farming, for instance, we'll take one to start with. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, the revolution is in the guidance of tractors and tillage 
and that uh, that was once uh, a that was that was once a luxury, and now in big cropping operations, it's just so common, and you can buy it uh, embedded at the factory, or it can be added on. And because it is uh, such a great market, there are competing add-ons. You can get them for old tractors, uh, and so that's an example. And then uh, technologies build on that to. Uh, improve productivity in many, many, many ways. Or in um, construction, uh, there was a time when surveyors used to put in stakes and mark the land. And now uh, much of that can be automated right into the machine with the uh, automated functions and uh, the guidance and viewing to an operator. Um, Great uh, things like uh, bulldozer blades uh, are governed by uh, automated technologies that are added on to what we would think of as heavy conventional machines. Uh, uh, big trucks in surface mines um, are benefiting from features of automation. So, so, and to me, the, I mean, the striking thing, in, in the things you're describing, is, is in a sense how undramatic they are. You're talking about kind of kind of robots getting embedded, yeah. uh, almost without us realizing into all kinds of aspects of our lives. And yeah. Well, well. So, so it, it's not like there's any plot afoot. I mean, <laughs> nobody, it, it's not like robotics is uh, 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 campaigning. Uh, for the for these revolutions, uh, but I've already mentioned that quietly, over the course of short time, uh, space exploration has transformed from people to machines, or that uh, uh, quietly the family car uh, has those add-on features of automated braking, tip-over stability control, uh, the uh, 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 anti-crash protection, slow speeds. Uh, and it, oh, it, it, it parallel parking. And at first, sure, it's a little uh, out there, a luxury, and uh, uh, maybe you only experience it in your rental car. But after you like it, you buy it, and pretty quickly. So, so Rodney, you want to jump yeah, in I, here? Yeah, I just want to add on to something Red said. I don't think people realize how much of the food that you are eating today has had a robotic element in its, in its production. Um, tractors uh, are, as, as Red said, have add-ons or come from the factory. They use GPS. They use extra beacons that are at the dealers, the ag equipment dealers. And not only are they guided, but they're using satellite data from those fields to know how much uh, fertilizer to put where on the field and how much seed to put in. This is all happening or, 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 or automatically, and that's the food we're, we're eating today is produced by these robotic systems. And getting back to, to the original point about um, uh, this displacement of workers. Um, I come from Australia originally, and, and there's some very big mining companies there um, that are digging up half of Australia is coal and sending it to India, and the other half is iron and sending it to China. Um, and Australia is a really lousy place to live, especially out where those open pit iron mines are. And they just can't get people to go out there. They've tried all sorts of things, and people don't want to work there. They want to, it, it's a horrible place to be. One of the most recent things that happened was that the, uh, uh, one of the mining companies, um, uh, Rio Tinto, raided the Australian Navy because um, they thought, well, who is technically competent and doesn't mind living in a really lousy place? <laughs> <laughs> Submariners. <laughs> now, Australia only has six submarines, but it can only send one of them to sea at a time because the submariners are all working for Rio Tinto <laughs> up in Hammersley, and uh, they're left without them. So there's an incredible labor shortage that robotics is helping solve. I'd loop back, I'd loop back to this, uh, the real question, which was, uh, and what about all the jobs? And uh, uh, my decades of history say that robotics uh, contributes uh, uh, net net jobs, and uh, going back to the earliest classic experiences of my own life, 
example, with robotics, that uh, uh, when s the spray painting of cars was uh, a fresh idea in Detroit, the first reaction was that it would never succeed technically, that it could not become reliable, that it would be far too expensive, that it shouldn't happen to my job, and that it shouldn't happen in my plant. And uh, I don't know authoritatively, but I have to imagine that it is impossible to get a human spray-painted car anymore. And that even if it could, most of the audience couldn't afford it. And, um, but the most important thing is that if an automaker didn't embrace automation in that way and in welding and so many more, there's no chance of them being an auto company or being in existence. So let, let, let me pull us now. I mean, we're, we're in, the, in the present. Let me kind of pull us into the future. Uh, I mean, Rodney, you, you've talked a bit about about sort of four four goals or four you know, sort of four four directions uh, for you know, kind of like define the the next next stage in robotics. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I've, I've been setting uh, out four four goals for for researchers that I think if we made progress on any of these four goals, our robots will get a whole lot better. And uh, we're not going to solve any one of them, but we might make progress. And a lot of people here at, at CMU are working uh, on things which will make these these uh, challenges uh, be be closer in. First one is the object recognition capabilities of a two-year-old child. If you have a two-year-old child and you show them this chair, which they've never seen one that looks exactly like this before, they'll be able to say that's a chair because they've un they can understand uh, function from form. And likewise, you know, show them my shoes they've never seen. Well, sh no, show them most weird shoes. And <laughs> they've never seen shoes like that before, but a two-year-old will tell you that's a shoe. Uh, you know, our vision, our computer vision systems are not that good, but if our, if our robots did have that capability, we'd be able to do a, lot, a whole lot more. Second capability, the language capabilities of a four-year-old child. And at CMU here, a lot of people are working on language. But a, a four-year-old child, um, when you talk to them, you don't have to dumb down the grammar uh, hardly at all. You may have to restrict the vocabulary, but they can understand what you're saying, full grammar, and they can understand in a noisy environment, and they can understand weird accents, uh, and they have no trouble at all with that, much better than their current speech systems. That will let us communicate with our robots better. The manual dexterity of a six-year-old child. A six-year-old child can tie shoelaces. A six-year-old child <coughs> can do every manual operation that a Chinese worker does in a Chinese factory. Um, and so that level of dexterity, uh, which is a combination of new sorts of sensors, new sorts of actuators, and algorithms, will let our robots do a whole lot more in the world. So that's two-year-old two vision, four-year-old language, six-year-old dexterity, social understanding of an eight- or nine-year-old child. An eight- or nine-year-old child understands the difference between their knowledge of the world and someone they're interacting with. So when they're showing uh, someone, a robot, how to do a task, they know to look at where their eyes, the eyes of the ro robot is looking, look at uh, the social cues from the, from, the, from the robot to determine whether they're transferring the information as they're trying to program the robot <laughs> in real time. So they're, they're my four, four capabilities that I think if we make progress on any of those four, our robots will get a lot better than they are now. I, I have to say, I mean, one of the things that really struck me, I mean, talking, talking to these four panelists earlier and, and taking a, a tour around some of the robotics projects at, at Carnegie Mellon is, you know, with keeping these things in mind of, like, where the, where the technology is going, um, you know, there's sort of the, the uh, probably the, you know, the, the oldest and cliche in, in, in this, uh, of all robotics is the sort of like, you know, the fear of the, the you know, the robots will compete with us and you know, robots will turn against us. You know, this, or this, the, the, you know the, the, the ethical question is, you know, can we trust robots? That's actually the, the cover story in this month's uh, issue of Popular Mechanics magazine. Uh, but what really struck me, you know, talking to these panelists and you know, talking to the, the roboticists here was actually the opposite question of, um, you know, you know, is it going, you know, will we reach a point, perhaps even quite soon, when it is ethically imperative to use robots? Um, you know, when you know, in medicine, you know, having a human perform an operation instead of a robot would actually be considered, you know, not providing best quality of care. Um, you know, when you know, when I mean, we, we're already seeing right now. You know, if you want, if you want, you know, if you want the sort of like the mind expanding exploration. Maybe maybe a robot is what you really need. If you need to keep your industry running, maybe a robot is what you really need. What are, are there? Do you do you see ethical areas where where robots are actually Im imperative? Well, it was interesting at the Crandall Canyon, Utah, mine disaster. 
that had, after two weeks, uh, that was a coal mine disaster. So as you know, there's a lot of methane usually associated with it. You have to be intrinsically safe. There's no robot that's, that's certified for mine intrinsically safe conditions. But after two weeks, they were so desperate to, to figure out what had happened, even though they believed the, the miners were lost at that point, that because there had been no sign of methane, they agreed to let robots be used. And so in three days, we pulled together a set of robots for the Mine Safety and Health Administration and deployed them. And it was ethically imperative to let the families know that the best, that every possible thing had been done to try to rescue or at least identify what happened to these miners. And also for the families of the six other miners who were trying to rescue those who lost their lives in the secondary collapse at Crandall Canyon, it was ethically imperative. And I think for me, out of all the things that we've, we've done, talking with the families about that and having them grateful that these things were tried and convinced in their own heart that this was going to help in the future is a milestone. Yeah, I just want to point out an, eth an ethical case that, that is in common practice now. When we first started sending robots to Afghanistan in 2002 for an improvised explosive device, a roadside bomb, uh, U.S. military doctrine was to put someone in a bomb suit and send them out to poke it. That's no longer the case. The robot has to be sent uh, 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 to poke the the, uh, the bomb uh, rather than the person. And at, at iRobot, uh, and probably the other companies that provide such robots, at iRobot we regularly get uh, letters uh, from people out in the field saying, your robot saved my life or my buddy's lives today. And so the, that's where the ethic ethics have said, you are not to send a soldier first, you are to send a robot first. That's, that's changed. I, I would also like to add to that um, the ethical imperative uh, to also do research so that we can invent the technology that will save lives and will transform lives in the future. Um, I, I was struck with that. At uh, one point, my son had an accident and he went to the emergency room. There was this amazing team of, of doctors and robots. They didn't move, but they were basically robots. They had sensors. They were acting on my child. And this coordination of the robots and the doctors is what made the life of my child possible. And what struck me at the time is, well, somebody has built these robots. Somebody has funded the research that made possible these robots. And at the time, probably, they didn't imagine what these robots were going to look like. And it's the same for us. We don't know exactly how this technology is going to uh, look like. But we also have an imperative to make it happen and, and, and to make possible the future that is going to change those lives. At the same time, I also recognize, um, with others, the, the potential problems of robot technologies. And, and I think we shouldn't be naive about them, and we should be conscious of possible problems. So uh, uh, about three years ago, uh, in West Virginia, a uh, coal mine accident uh, entrapped a dozen. And we have the uh, great advantage of knowing how that turned out because one person made it. And uh, those miners, by training, were all alive and went to the location to wait. But the procedure of sending humans to get to them moves a little, stops a little, checks a little, waits a little, moves a little, stops a little, checks a little, waits a little, and gets to them in over 30 hours. Now, how it turned out is that deaths occurred about 24 hours. And that uh, a, a right robot uh, might uh, reach those miners in two hours. Uh, and uh, little known is that uh, a robot uh, was deployed in that response. And one principle of this ki that kind of work is that if a technology isn't part of the solution, that um, it can be part of the problem. And that's why you really get it right before you go. And um, no matter what we say about uh, robot challenges in the great future, uh, something absolute on the list is that it is inevitable that uh, a robot will be 
uh, clearly credited with rescue of a human life. That'll, that'll occur. Uh, and um, it could be that uh, some of us here uh, would be the ones to do that. And I would also observe that um, uh, several thousand coal miners uh, die each year in China. Okay. And that that is uh, an imperative for uh, the robotics agenda. Yeah, I just want to say as, a, as sort of a wrapping up thought to this to this first part. Um, I mean, you're, ta you're talking about you know, you know, the, you know, explicit saving of a life by a search and rescue robot. But I think if you if you start to you know, use the broader definition that we've been talking about here, if you're looking talking about robotics as as used in medicine. If you're talking about robotics as used in in automobiles for you know for 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 for, for crash avoidance. Um, I mean, I think there, you could actually tally, I would imagine, thousands or tens of thousands of lives already uh, saved by, by robotics. And the, you know, the sort of the moral imperative of using robots, I think, becomes clearer and clearer as you add that up. Um, I do want to wrap up the first part of the conversation here, uh, but I'd love to explore more about the, the future directions and you know, some of, the, some of the, you know, the, the, the ethical imperatives and the kind of like the, the high frontier of where we could be going in the question and answer session. But first, I want to thank by start by thanking our panelists here for giving a lot of expertise, a lot of vision. Thank you all very much. For Rodney, uh, you said when you were talking about your robots uh, that were deployed to Afghanistan and even the the Roomba robots that what you found out was that people didn't use the robots where the way you wanted them to; do. they used the robots the way they wanted them to, and I was curious about what you meant by that. I mean, what okay. kinds of examples did yeah. you have of that? Yeah, maybe, maybe the words weren't quite right, but, but uh, here's an example. We, we got word back from the field in Afghanistan and Iraq that the um, soldiers didn't like the uh, menu system that our engineers had designed where you could go down and, and, and touch anything. In fact, they said it sucked, uh, I think was the quote. And, uh, you know, one of our uh, MIT engineers said, well, we, we need smarter users then. Um, the solution instead was to uh, ship controllers based on Game Boys, uh, zero training. Uh, after five minutes, the soldiers had 85% of the capability of the robot. So it required a different way of thinking about how someone was going to interact with that robot and what they were going to bring to the interaction, not what an engineer brings. Oh, there's this menu here and I can do this. It's, a, it's someone worried about getting their head blown off and trying to do something really fast and, and, and make it happen. And, and with respect to the Roomba, did you find something? And I was wondering if Javier had something to say about his... Well, well here, here's an example that, that, that just com completely shocked us. At the start, we had a rocker switch on the very first model. That was a total disaster. What's on? What's off? Uh, calls all the time. How do I switch it on? Use this rocker switch. So now a Roomba has one button in the middle that says clean. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, no, I think I think there's. I mean, it's a great question, which is, you know, in in the midst of all this, you know, all, all this engineering, obviously there've been some some mistakes, some mistakes, some mistakes of execution, some mistakes of, of design, some mistakes that turned out to be things that maybe were interesting from an engineering perspective, but turned out not to be of any interest to anybody in the real world. And I, I think there were a few other examples. Robin, did you have? Uh, we we started doing rescue robotics back in 1995, so we had several, four years of, of nice theoretical work before we started working with rescue teams. And we just thought, you know, we just worked really hard on building robots that could go over the rubble piles and then it would go over the rubble piles and it would let out little small robots and they would do all this stuff. And then we realized you'd never need it to go over the rubble piles. It was only the small ones that was of any use at all. And I think that was really one of the nice things about being a, a, a woman in computer science and doing robotics is that the rescue team, uh, Task Force 3, looked at us, and I think if it had been guys, they would have just said, oh, what geeks, get out of here. Right? But they felt sorry for us, kind of like you do for, you know, the little sad niece or something. And they said, come on, come on, we'll come back and try again. And so we began to learn a lot more and work, work more closely with the users. And, uh, and, and Javier, well, I mean, you, 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 you made small children cry, so that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's clearly a misapplication of technology. Yeah. And their parents. But they also made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
But I, I have here an example also of the importance of field studies, which is something that you know, I think is being recognized. That, um, so as I said before, one of the things we worked on was expression recognition systems. And we were pretty sure we had the best that was out there. It worked really well in all the databases in the field. And we have these databases where we compete against each other and see how well we do on them. And, and in the lab, it worked quite well. So we put in this robot so that it would actually uh, respond to the children when they smile, the robot smile, and all these things. And it was a disaster. It just didn't work at all. You know, the illumination conditions were completely different, I guess. The databases that had been collected at the time just didn't take into consideration the field conditions that actually the brain needs to uh, take into consideration. Because of that, we collected a, a better database. And because of that, now, you have cameras that have a smile recognition system. It came out of that project. That's where we learned what it took to have systems that work in real life. And th this is something maybe we'll come back to with a, with a, with a later question, the whole question of, of how humans and robots should, should interact, because I think there's been a, probably a, a lot of mistakes in the past about that. But let's, let's move to the next question. Thank you very much. So I'm curious, we've focused on sort of the positive aspects of robotics. There's a trend now towards arming robots and putting them in uh, you know, military combat situations. I'd love to hear the panelists' thoughts about that and the ethics involved. Anybody want to tackle that? Well, um, uh, before the uh, earlier uh, uh, war, uh, we were on the eve of battle, and it was uh, one of those... Uh, times when America is glued to its televisions, uh, 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 speculating on the deaths that would occur the next day. The tanks were about to roll, and the Apaches were about to fly. And uh, uh, it's uh, often in those times that whether uh, the people are um, pro-war or anti-war, uh, the deep human considerations are uh, uh, who's going to die. And um, the uh, great prospect is that um, robot roles in such conflicts will uh, reduce um, human injury, injury and death. And then um, there's another side of it that uh, asks the question, and um, what side of that conflict is the robotic technology on? Right. I think the I think the, the core of the question is, you know, is this a dehumanizing of, of warfare? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to jump in here because I'm I uh, I think uniquely on the panel uh, um, started a company which does build military robots. Um, uh, we. What I think what scares people uh, about uh, robots is giving them uh, targeting authority, letting them make decisions on who's going to get shot. I don't think that's going to happen any time in the short term, in the U.S. military at least. It may happen um, in um, what I would call Home Depot-style robotics uh, with uh, insurgents in, in, in non-government combatants building systems which might do that. In the past, we have... Uh, as a worldwide community, uh, decided certain things are immoral and outlawed them through the Geneva, Con Geneva Conventions. Uh, biological weapons is one of those things. Biological weapons are pretty easy to make. Uh, they, the Geneva Conventions have largely kept them out of play. Um, now might be the time, if people feel that they should, to talk about modifying the Geneva Conventions to put in constraints on having robotic systems make targeting decisions by themselves, but and this gets you know back to the question of surgery. Well, you know, do do you want a, do you want a human doing microsurgery on your pumping heart, or do you want a robot doing microsurgery on your pumping heart? It may not be too long before automatic systems might be better at making judgments than humans are. Um, so the other thing to think about is that a robot doesn't have to shoot first. You send a bunch of 19-year-old kids who are our soldiers, and that's who we send as our soldiers. They go bravely to do this. You send them in to a, to a uh, dark room uh, with guns, and they think, they're getting, they think they're getting shot at, they will shoot back without 
waiting to ask questions. If you send a robot in, the robot can wait and see what happens before it shoots back, and it could be under remote control in any case. So the robot can afford to take the damage that we wouldn't ask a person to take. So I think it's a, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult question. There's, there's arguments both sides, and there are mechanisms which we could decide that we want to uh, adopt as a worldwide community now. Uh, I just want to add a quick cut. Robin, you, you were talking about this a little bit over dinner, uh, where you have these you know, these predator drones that are, I mean, they're they're nominally robotic planes, but they don't they don't fire on their own. They fire under the, the you know the, the command of a of a of a human operator. Um, you have a human operator who's who's doing this by remote control. Uh, actually, you know, having a, a human operating this by remote controls in some ways a more dehumanized sense of warfare than if you had a set of algorithms where the, you know, the, the drone was operating on its own according to you know, sort of rigorous and inflexible you know, sort of rules of combat that, that could not be overridden. Do you want to just... you know, we're seeing some internal studies come out more and more from the human factors community that, that you're getting the video game effect where you know, massive overkill from a person uh, doing a joystick and, and shooting at people, which is, of, of course, in the end, that, that comes back to haunt you as a person. It's, it's hard, hard when, once you realize that that wasn't a video game, that that was, that was real people. And there is the, um, the idea that, that robots, once you have the targeting, don't do that. They don't overreact. So it's an, it's an, interesting, an interesting set of points that we'll have to work for, out for ourselves. But there are a lot of cases even now where we have friendly fire and fratricide. There's areas where you set off areas where nobody's supposed to come in except the bad guys, and you just, as soon as something comes in that area, you, the rules of engagement are to shoot, and they do it. Okay, and sometimes accidents happen, and again, perhaps robots are better for that, or perhaps that's just fine to substitute uh, a robot for a person in those cases. You've got, you've got the Koreans putting out uh, supposedly fully autonomous systems to, to shoot on, the, uh, on their border. So it's going to be an interesting time. So we have another question. Corey, at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned the uh, possibility that President Obama is going to cancel uh, the space program, uh, the manned space program. So I wanted to ask uh, specifically Red and Rod, how is, could we not waste the money and investment and technological advances that we have made over the last 30 years and then over the last 10 or 15 with the Constellation program and use that, combine it with uh, future robotic exploration of space so uh, we can still take advantage of what we've already invested in this area. Yeah, I'm not sure if, the, if it seems like the microphone wasn't really picking that up, so let me just kind of repeat that. The, the question is, that if, if we're significantly scaling back uh, the, the, the manned space exploration program, um, what can we do to sort of maximize what we've already invested and kind of merge that with, with robotics to really, to really give you the most, the, yeah, the most robust, the most inspiring kind of uh, space exploration program that we could have? First, uh, I'll, uh, the, the, the uh, first compliment is that uh, robotics precursors uh, could uh, vastly improve and alter the prospects for human exploration. So, for example, uh, something recently discovered from orbit is the opening to a lunar cave. And there are extensive caves on the moon, uh, and uh, they're important because humans uh, don't do well with the extreme heat and the extreme cold on the surface. Uh, but just a small uh, depth underneath is uh, moderate temperature, not unlike this in places. And uh, those caves are waiting, not there to be dug. But very clearly, no human would be the first one in because uh, those kinds of explorations that go out of sight and out of communication are exactly the kinds that we never risk human first. Once determined, those could be havens. So, so we could do much higher risk exploration because 
you, you know, if, if you lose 10 robots, you don't worry about it. If you lose one person, that could shut down your entire space program. Is that a fair summary? Uh, it's, it, there's certainly, uh, as, as we're all aware, big consequences to loss. The second are opportunities of locale. So there are places near the poles which are Talking imagined. About the poles of the moon. The poles of the moon in this case, which are uh, regions of persistent light where it stays lit night and day. And that is uh, sometimes, that, that, that is arguably the most valuable real estate in the solar system if it's really there, if it really has those lighting conditions, if it's really uh, amenable for landing and the like. Mm -hmm. And what a gift for robotics to confirm, survey, and uh, establish oh. a comp. You know, Rodney, you, you've thought about this a fair bit as well, right? Yeah. I'm Brad was talking about precursor missions. I, I think that, uh, in addition to those, the, the most astounding thing for us as humankind will be if we discover life somewhere else. Uh, we're looking at extrasolar planets with very remote techniques, but there's a whole bunch of places in the solar system that look promising, in the, in the moons of Jupiter, moons of Saturn, and, and back again to, to Mars more extensively. For the cost of two shuttle launches, we could have extent, an extensive mission to each of those places. So if, there, if this does come to pass and if this does free up more money for robotic missions, I think uh, that, you know, it increases our, our probability or our, our capability to detect life. And if we detect any such life, analyzing the way that life works is going to open up whole new vistas of our understanding and change ourselves philosophically. Hi. Uh, my question is actually also directed to Professor Brooks, though I'm sure some others will have something to say about this. As far as um, I know, growing up, I think it was on Nova Specials or something else, they mentioned the COG project constantly, and it was kind of like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And so um, kind of leading into that, uh, this what happened to the COG project, especially considering you were talking about like the big advancements that would occur with trying to get robots to do things that young children can do by uh, the program? Project. Well, the, 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 the robot wore out. It was replaced by the Domo project, which uh, had lasted for a number of years. And out of that has come a whole bunch of PhD theses, uh, uh, Aaron Edsinger, uh, Paul Fitzpatrick, Matt Williamson, um, Cynthia Brazil's thesis about social interaction. All those things came out. And some of those things are now getting put into, into various products by some spin-out companies that have, that have come along. But the, the rule of thumb I have is it takes 10 to 15 years from when you first demonstrate something in a lab to when it becomes a commercial product. We had a vacuum cleaning robot in my lab around 1990 to 1992. Um, we weren't very good at it then. It sucked all the dust through the circuit boards, for instance, which was bad. <laughs> it took many years to turn into a real product. So those things that happened during the 90s, the early, the, the early noughties, the early 2000s, uh, I think you'll start to see some of those things come out in products before too long. Let me follow up quickly. Cause, I mean, in, in, in computing, uh, people are, you know, often talk about, about Moore's Law, this idea that every, every 18 months or so uh, that, that they, you have a, a doubling of, of computer power of, of, of memory density. Uh, is there something like that in robotics? Is there some way to quantify sort of how, how, things are, how quickly things are actually progressing? Well, I think you can have metrics in various fields. One of my favorite examples is... Um, and it's, it's, it's using an exponential that is the exponential of processing power and its cheaper sensors. When um, I first came to the U.S., I was sort of a junior gopher for Hans Moravec, who's been part of the Robotics Institute here for many years out at Stanford. And in 1979, I remember working late at night with him when no one else was using the mainframe, and his robot would go autonomously through a crowded room 20 meters in six hours. Now... Uh, Ian Horswell, uh, one of my graduate students at uh, uh, MIT, his robot Polly, in uh, 1992, 13 years later, would give tours of the lab and could operate for about six hours and go 2,000 meters. So 20 meters, 2,000 meters in six hours. In um, 2005, the uh, uh, DARPA Grand Challenge, the first, well, it was really the second one when uh, robots finished, 
uh, they went uh, 200 kilometers in six hours, another two orders of magnitude. So therefore, over a 26-year span, we see you know, these plot points go where there were 13 doublings in capability in 26 years if you measure, if the metric is the distance the robot can go autonomously without human intervention in six hours. So we have seen mm -hmm. um, Moore's law in action with, with robots. That's good. Next question. I'd like to ask the panelists to speculate on how language will change as a result of robotics. If, if you ask people of our generation what a phone is, a phone is something you talk on. If you ask a 10-year-old what a phone is, a phone is a computer that fits in your pocket. And yeah, you can talk on it, but you know, they, they rather text anyway, and they use it to play music and take photographs. And it's, you know, the talking is sort of incidental. The, the whole concept of a phone is, is morphed away from the meaning, you know, phone from Latin is sound, right? Sound isn't really the central thing anymore. So maybe each of the panelists could pick a word in English that they think the meaning is gonna change as a result of robotics. <laughs> I, I think in the future the, the prefix robo will probably be attached to everything. <laughs> that's, that's my prediction. No, that's so 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're already beyond right, I'll, I'll, I, I'll, I might start off by saying that uh, 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 it's not enough that robots uh, uh, achieve their purpose or uh, look good doing it. Uh, they're now expected to uh, communicate at the same time. And uh, that uh, uh, one essential feature for uh, a moon robot, non-federal, is that it does a good job of twittering to the world and uh, talking about where it is and where it's going and um, how the weather is and uh, the like. And yeah, I, I think, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, one of, one of the amazing things with, with Sojourner, I mean, part, part of what made that such a, a, a landmark was that people followed it on the internet. And, you know, and that doesn't seem like such an amazing thing now, but in 1997, um, you know, it, it, this was like one of the, you know, it was probably the, like, like the first great scientific mass hit on the internet. Uh, all these people following this rover, and, you know, that, that had a transformative effect. That's fair. People followed Sojourner. And then, uh, with the uh, current spirit and opportunity, uh, you can ask questions and get responses, and that's still uh, the kind of Wizard of Oz man behind the screen, because there's a human that is writing back. And uh, uh, the next step is for those machines to we need a, be supporting, we need a word. generating we need a word. conversation <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, for that to be uh, automated and of course automated across the globe in all languages and the like. So my sense that is that uh, 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 robots will uh, have their own form of uh, Twitter. I, I just say the word appliance. Uh, some number of years from now, there will be no appliance in your home which will not be robotic, not be connected to the net, and not have some transformative things which are too hard for us to imagine in the same way, you know, uh, 20 years ago, we, we couldn't have ima imagined phone transforming into this. Um, they certainly didn't in Star Trek. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, But appliances will transform what it means to be an appliance. Yeah, Robin, you have a suggestion? And I think... Uh you know, thinking about your word, you know, phone has changed, what that means to people. I think team, the word team is going to change. That in the future when we think of a team and we don't have some component of AI, either software-based or physically based, it, it won't really be a team. I actually think it's going to change the meaning of the word human. In that it, the, the fact that we're going to have intelligent systems that approximate the way we behave and is going to make us rethink how we are put together and what it means to be a human. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a fair chance that the, the, you know, our, our first experience with alien intelligence will probably be happening right here on this planet. But that's a question for another time. Uh, if the scientists and researchers are sort of the jet engines behind the technology, I would say the lawyers are the strong headwind. Um, I, I heard that last week Wired Magazine reported that uh, it was the 25th anniversary of the first human killed by a robot. It was a worker in a factory that was hit by a robot. 
Um, uh, is there anything that the panelists can say that how we, you know, I'm very enthusiastic about this technology and I think mo most of the audience is here. Uh, is there anything we can do as, as a society to st structurally to help allow technology that may eventually uh, uh, harm people but actually in the long run cause a, a benefit to be able to, you know, avoid sort of the, 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 the lawyers and the malpractice, uh, you know, uh, the liability uh, sort of preventing this technology from uh, being deployed and changing our, our lives? Well, uh, in pioneering any movement, um, something that always makes the difference is the research courage and the uh, compelling motivation to get to the other side of making it work. Uh, and that's certainly not unique to robotics. Uh, uh, this city, for example, um, had uh, a tremendous history in the development of organ transplant. And it's just a, an analogy for the idea that uh, along the way to the uh, miraculous uh, capabilities uh, today, uh, there uh, were uh, risks and uh, actions that are undertaken. And that, uh, I, d I don't want to be dramatic about that because uh, I don't pretend that uh, this era of robotics is anywhere at that level. Um, and then uh, the reality is that uh, uh, it, it's one of the reasons why innovators and uh, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, risk takers and uh, those who go boldly are the ones that really make the difference because the reality is uh, that uh, the, there are those uh, liabilities of the type that you speak about and the issues that you speak about are there everywhere. Introducing a first robot to the nuclear world uh, would have had many speculations about what possible consequences that could occur if something goes wrong. And um, somehow uh, pioneers make it work anyway. Uh, in the coal mines, there was that sense of not being a hummingbird. I think it's up for question. It's amazing how much better that gas sensors are than human mm -hmm. nose. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, the, uh, uh, the reality is that uh, uh, there will come a time uh, when uh, we are faced with uh, a circumstance where robots will really make a difference. And, and in, the, in the face of it, we'll go for it. Let's say when we have here somebody who's really you know, is kind of jumping full force into the, you know, into the commercial world right now. So, I mean, clearly you, you have faith that it's possible. Um, well, well, yeah, and, and, I, and I should point out if, if um, we had listened to lawyers, we would not have released the Roomba because they, would, they said that we would get sued all the time. We have not had one safety suit. Um, uh, there have been some nuisance suits which were not, uh, were, were got, gotten, didn't go forward because there were, there were actually, you know, there was fraud involved in them. But there hasn't been a single safety suit with five million of these sold where the lawyers were telling us we would die on the vine uh, by putting this technology out there. We were careful. We put in triple redundancy uh, for various safety systems, um, but uh, uh, one has to one has to at some point believe that you have built a safe system, and not worry about the minuscule chance that that could be something that goes wrong. Otherwise, we would never adv advance technologically. I do think there's one thing that I see a lot of, and and we're seeing as as the rush, particularly with military robots, we see a lot of things coming out that are prototypes in the lab, and there's a bit of a culture of, well, I just have to make my widget work, I just have to you know get close enough, and not thinking about the downstream consequences, and we're beginning to see with UAVs, well, uh, it's an autonomous system, and it was. It behaved unpredictably because the environment was unpredictable. Well, you may not know exactly how it's going to behave, that the environment's unpredictable, but you know it's unpredictable. So if you don't have good callback procedures, if you, aren't, if you don't have a culture of safety, a culture of looking ahead, you're violating what's called operational morality in the ethics literature. And I think that's, 
that's the thing that we as roboticists may be leaving ourselves vulnerable. We're forgetting that that larger safety culture, the fact that what we build actually counts for something and does interact with the real world, and we're leaving ourselves open to the lawyers to come back at us. Whereas in the case of, in the commercial world, you learn very much how to make things safe and what was important. And that's just a vacuum cleaner, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's not going to fall in the sky and kill you or anything like that. Yeah, I, I think I, I think there's an important point here, which is, which is that you know, you know, calling calling something a robotic system doesn't automatically put it into a different category than any other kind of tool or invention. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's a certain level of, 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 of common sense, you know, respect for, for how, how people work and how people live. And there's also, a, you, know, you know, a certain element that you have to, you have to keep taking risks to, to invent as you, would with, with, as you would with pharmaceuticals, as you would with, with sort of with any other kind of advance. I mean, I think if, you, if you're trying to find, you know, the first person who was killed by technology was probably, you know, some guy hit by a spear about 100,000 years ago, and yet somehow we managed to keep, keep going on. So, yeah. Okay, I, th I, th I think that has, that has to conclude our event for, for now. But uh, I, again, I thank you all so very much for coming. Uh, I thank the panelists for this for a, a wonderful and uh, sort of wide-ranging discussion. Uh, Carnegie Mellon and the National Science Foundation for, for making all of this possible. Um, and I really appreciate all of your attention for the evening. Thank you all. Thank you.